A generation without hope is a generation without testimonies. It's not a light matter. It's not like, oh, let's tell another story as, you know, story time around a fireplace. These are weighty revelations of the nature of God that carry with it a compelling invitation. We must know God in this way. And he says multiple generations are actually affected in their eternal destiny by the influence of testimony in their thinking in their lives. lot of shouts in here today. Yeah, it's Sunday, that's right. Come, come to church and lose your voice. What a way to go. Well, happy Palm Sunday, my goodness. Um, you know, one of the most fun weeks I've had, uh, in, I've been here 28 years, one of the most fun weeks I have ever had was the week of fasting that we had in January where we met in the mornings for prayer. It so rocked me, my goodness. And I can hardly wait till tomorrow because we're doing the same thing again and uh, meeting at 7.30, 7.30 in the morning for those of you that are able to join us. Oh my, it just, it just messed me up in a really good way. And, uh, and then uh, we're gonna also uh, have times of worship at night, eight to nine o'clock, so... If you're able to join for that, that would be wonderful. And then Good Friday is going to be a good Friday. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. When I say I want a biblical wife, what, I'm, what people think I mean is I want a wife who is passive and subservient. What I really mean is I want a wife who is totally willing to drive a tent peg into the tyrant's heads should the opportunity arise. <laughs> If you're familiar with the Old Testament story, that helps. That's a, that's a great definition of a biblical wife. And, and I'll tell you, most of the people in the body of Christ who scare me are women. I'm just telling you. They just absolutely scare me. And I know some. I think they carry a tent peg in their back pocket. You know, They're, they're just ready. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I had, oh, here. In a kindergarten class, a teacher offers the kids $5 if they can name the most famous person who ever lived. Little Sean O'Sullivan said, St. Patrick. Teacher says, no, I'm sorry, Sean, that's not correct. Little Johnny Williams says, Abraham Lincoln. She says, no, Johnny, I'm afraid that's not the answer. Little David Goldberg said, Jesus Christ. The teacher says, that's right, David, you get $5. He comes up to collect the money and the teacher says, you know, David, being Jewish, I'm surprised you said Jesus. David replies, in my heart, I know it's Moses, but business is business. <laughs> I don't know, is that legal to do that, that one? Is, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, I'm sure I'll get some emails. All right, thank you, Lord. <laughs> um, Palm Sunday, wow. I've never uh, given a message on Palm Sunday about Palm Sunday, so... I'm not going to date today either, except, <laughs> except we're going to read some scripture. I'll talk a few minutes and we're going to go into the subject that I have for today. <laughs> that's, that's kind of sad, isn't it? Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 12. I want, I want to look at the, this particular part of the story. And then uh, we're going to move into uh, kind of an extension of the last time I talked. I talked a couple of weeks ago about remembering. The Lord says, don't forget my benefits. <clears throat> so I want to do a spin off from that. But John chapter 12, um, John's account of the triumphal entry of Jesus says the next day, a great multitude, verse 12, uh, next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him. They cried out, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when they found a young donkey, when he found a, a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, O daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him. And that he had done these things to them. One of the most consistent things, this is a little off subject, a lot off subject actually, but one of the most consistent things that you'll find about the prophetic in scripture is it's not understood until after it's fulfilled. 
it's, it's rarely, I don't know that it's ever given so that we can create charts of what's about to happen. I think it's supposed to be lodged in our hearts so that as things unfold, we realize, oh, he's in charge. Amen, Bill, good point. Verse 17. <laughs> Thanks. I'll pay you later. Verse 17. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, people also met him because they heard he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing one another. They're pointing at each other. It's so funny, they're turning on each other. They said among themselves, you are doing nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. It's such a lovely verse. Um, palm branches were, were a sign of victory in battle. And so when they laid palm branches out for Jesus to come into the city, they were walking, welcoming him as a victorious king. Kings, when they normally would enter a city, however, would ride on a war horse. I don't know how many of you have ever studied uh, war horses. It's fascinating. It's in the Minor Prophets. They talk about them. And war horses were unusual creatures in that they actually could smell and hear war, and they would run to battle. They were attracted to war. They actually could stand, for example, if the, if the owner was in this uh, place of conflict and they were standing next to a burning building, that burning building could actually burn some of the flesh on that horse and he would hold his position. They were so resolved and so focused in discipline. Incredible, incredible animals. Jesus came not just, not on a war horse, came on a donkey, but not just a donkey, came on a colt. Because this triumphant king came as the Prince of Peace. The battle never was between God and the devil. That's not a contest. The enemy has worked ever since people were created to tarnish what was made in his image. He sees the Father's delight in people and he wants to do anything to tarnish that joy through marking humanity with sin and distraction. Jesus comes into this city and they lay down palm branches to welcome a victorious king and he's not yet died. It's, I, don't, I don't know what all it means except we know that he was triumphant in his lifestyle over sickness, over disease. We know over sin. He was tempted in all manner as we are yet without sin. So he was victorious even before he died. But when he died, his victory was made available to all those made in his image that would put their faith in him. His victory became our victory. His victory was as the son of man because God needed no victory over the devil. It was as the son of man. The Bible calls him our elder brother. So he went ahead, obtained an inheritance for us so that everyone who would believe in him would step into the triumph and the victory of that triumphal entry. Psalms 24 says, lift up your heads, O you gates, that the king of glory might come in. In some ways, that prophetic picture of the Old Testament was realized in this triumphal entry because the people began to sing praises. Hosanna. They began to exalt him as the king of kings, as the Lord over all. And in this moment, God inhabits praise and this triumphant Jesus was about to put an end to the voice of the enemy and to sin and disease, to put an end to that voice by his own suffering. It's extraordinary what was accomplished in those days. And he did it with you in mind, with me in mind. John the Baptist is one of the great heroes of scripture. For me, I, I read of his life, uh, frequent, well, I, I go through the whole Bible all the time, but I, I like to take time to look at John the Baptist because of what Jesus had to say about him. So I want you to go to um, Matthew chapter 11 and we're going to take just a moment there before we actually turn back to the portion of Scripture I want, and it's in the Psalms. It's 119. But just go with me to Psalm, excuse me, to Matthew uh, chapter 11, and I want you to see a, a problem. First of all, Jesus later in Matthew 11 
describes uh, John, John the Baptist, as the greatest of all Old Testament prophets. John was an Old Testament prophet. All of Jesus' miracles were also in the Old Testament. The New Testament doesn't start till the blood of Jesus is shed, the blood of the new covenant. So everything he did was to close out the Old Testament and initiate the nature of the new, the momentum, the focus, the priority of the new. So he announces John the Baptist as the greatest of all Old Testament prophets. But he did that after this particular experience where John takes a couple of his disciples and sends them to Jesus. John's got a problem. John's in prison. And he's about to die and he knows it. He prepared the way for the Messiah. Jesus' own job description in Isaiah 61 that Jesus prophesied over his own life in Luke chapter 4 was to release from prison. And John was facing the reality that he prepared the way for the one who releases from prison, but he's not being released. You can imagine the questions. Did I get it right? I had one assignment to prepare the way for the Messiah. And he's got this one overwhelming question. Did I get it right? Matthew 11, verse one. Came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. When John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and he said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Now John has already prophesied that Jesus was the Messiah. At Jesus' own baptism, before Jesus came to him, he pointed to Jesus and he said, behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's already made the proclamation. He already knows with every cell, every fiber of his being, this is him. But now he's in prison. How many of you ever, ever had circumstances that made you wonder about the bold confession you once made <laughs> previous? So he says, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, two disciples, said to them, go tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. What did Dr. Jesus write out as his prescription? Testimonies. The profound nature of testimony, of a testimony. I'm discovering my own journey. We've been, we've been talking this subject for decades. But the profound nature of testimony, of a testimony is that it reveals the nature of God, it reveals the covenant of God with his people, and it gives us a personal invitation to encounter and know him in that way. It's a, it's a living invitation to an encounter. These stories of scripture, when, you've, when you read through Israel's history, you find the times, in fact, I, I talked about this some, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you find the times where Israel literally crashed and burned, and when you trace back what started it, is they forgot. They forgot what God had done. The testimony is not is not a bunch of trivial stories that make us feel warm and fuzzy, that help us just feel good for the moment. They are revelations of the nature and covenant of God. They carry with it such compelling um, evidence to the resurrection of Christ that it filters out all unimportant information. John is facing his final days. Jesus wants him to end well, and he gives him a prescription. Here, the blind see. John, you made this possible. The deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, 
the poor have the gospel preached to them. It's almost like eyes are wandering all over the place and Jesus says, nope, focus right back here. You got to end well, John. You got to end well. The testimony reveals the nature of God and it actually, uh, I'll show you some verses in a minute, but it actually enhances, I don't know how this works, so let me just ramble and hopefully I'll say something. It, it actually enhances the intellectual capacity of an individual because it starts with the nature of God and all truth starts with the nature of God. Mm-hmm. Beauty exists because he's beautiful. Yeah. Power exists because he's powerful. Love exists because he is love. All these things exist because of his own nature. Everything comes forth from him. Everything the enemy has done is to distort and pervert what God has made. It's not a war against God. He can't win that one. He just wants to embarrass by blemishing his creation that was made in his image. So testimonies reveal what he's like. I don't know how to do this yet. I, it's a huge part of my life, but I, I don't think I have it down yet, so I'm, I'm, I'm fighting for words here. I, I feel like there's something more deliberate I can do, we can do, to record and to meditate on our history with God. I was just at James River, great, great church uh, in uh, uh, Springfield, Missouri. Bethel was an Assembly of God church, proudly so. We, uh, I love the assemblies. Some of the finest people I've ever met in my life are assemblies. My mom is here today. Yay, my mom. <clears throat> 95 years young. Yes, she is. Yeah. Um, so I'm very thankful for that heritage. And I, I had the privilege, again, I've been going back now fairly often to this great, great church, little little tiny home group of about 12,000 people. Actually, it's up to 13,000 they've been growing. And uh, but I have such a wonderful time. And they, they are hosting a tremendous move of God. And they steward the testimony brilliantly. I'm, I, I'm, I get so encouraged. So we had this week, I was there for three nights, power, a week of power, and we had uh, hundreds of, of people healed. It was w- wonderful. But the, the one that just rocked me in some ways the most was a 14-year-old kid that stood up, gave testimony. It's a, uh, they have four campuses, so we got, the, the, their place is packed on a Wednesday night for a prayer meeting. 30, 35, 3,600 people, you know, people all over the, f- yeah, it's amazing. So the 14 year old kid stands up and he gives a testimony how he felt electricity go through his brain and he is now no longer autistic. <laughs> no longer autistic. God healed him. And just a pile of others. In fact, I have a video I was going to play, but it's 12 minutes long. And so I'll wait for a Sunday night. We can do the 12 minute version. So, but it's just so, so wonderful. So last night I was at one of our local restaurants and uh, uh, sitting there eating. And, and this young lady comes up to me, uh, ask, Are you Bill Johnson? I said, Yes, I am. She said, I knew that. But and then she, <laughs> she, she starts crying. She says, I was at your healing rooms today. And then she pulls out of her pocket hearing aids. Because she couldn't, she couldn't hear. And now she can hear perfectly. And she's, she's standing at the table. I, I was about six or eight of them in their group. They all ended up coming over to the table and giving them hugs and, and cheering them on and honoring them for making the journey that they did because that's what he's like. That's what he's like. I'll never forget the day I laid hands on little girl about five years old, uh, born deaf. And uh, I prayed for her, nothing happened. Then I remembered I'd ministered to the mother earlier in the day and she had some uh, spiritual issues. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe, maybe it got passed on. So I just prayed simply over her and broke that thing and then prayed again for her ears. I'll never forget the look. This little girl has never heard anything. And all of a sudden she goes... 
She starts looking all around because this room is filled with sound as sound begins to cascade into this little life. Because that's, that's what he's like. I remember here on a Sunday night, uh, somebody came up to me and said, a woman just got healed uh, of deafness. And I, I said, well, where is she? She was in the back over here. So I came running over to her and, and talked, wanted to talk to her to find out what had happened, not realizing she's never heard a word before. She doesn't know what words are. Never heard a sound. No sound. No sound ever. And I realized she doesn't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and a family member was there, began to sign, and began to explain the story, how her ears opened up right back over here, and she kept pointing to speakers that were up in the ceiling. Wow. And the family began to work with her to learn to speak, because she had never heard words or speak words. That week, she began to speak and speak in full sentences, but her first word out of her mouth was Jesus, which is a real good start. So she learned who did it. And uh, right, right back over there, it reminds me of one of our young men was down at the mall and saw this man with a very serious limp and uh, walked up and asked if he could pray and family members with him. And he didn't respond, but the family members said yes. So he prayed for him, come to find out he had a gunshot wound of all things and, uh, and was prayed for and was completely healed. So he's walking around and then he, our, our young man noticed this guy didn't say anything. So he asked the family, he said, can this man not speak? And they said, no, he's never spoken a word in his life. He said, well, can I pray for that? And the family, of course, you know, you're on a roll, let's go for it, you know. <laughs> And so he prays for that, and the first word out of his mouth was Jesus. His tongue was loosed, and he began to, began to speak. All of these are stories that reveal his nature. And maybe the one that rocks me the most was a 14-year-old girl from here, went on an outreach with some of our teams down to San Francisco. And uh, there was an elderly gentleman sitting on a, on a curb on a street corner. And she just sat down next to him and began to share the love of Jesus with this very elderly man. And he opened up to the gospel and was born again. Such a wonderful display of God's mercy and power came upon this guy's life as he's literally just overwhelmed by the goodness of God as he meets Jesus. She gets up, she's praying, talking to other people. After a while, half hour, hour later, she hears sirens. She follows the sirens, and this man had passed away. The man that she just led to the Lord. It's just like him to do that. It's just like him. That's what he's like. That's what he's like to take a 14-year-old girl out of a small town of Reading, take down to San Francisco, sit next to this guy who's right at the end of his journey and introduce him to Jesus. That's what he's like. See, these stories reveal his nature. And John's assignment was to prepare the way for the Messiah, which he did so profoundly, so beautifully. But Jesus wanted him to end well. And he said, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. This week, I was... I sat uh, with a pastor and, and family at an evening meal after a service and in walked a couple and the uh, pastor's wife, uh, Debbie, said, this is the woman that Uncle Willie, her uncle was my grandfather, Wilhelm Morkin. And she referred to him as Uncle Willie. This is the woman that Uncle Willie raised. When she was a year old, she drowned. And my grandfather took her and prayed over her, and she was raised from the dead. That's what he's like. Now she's a lot older. <laughs> and in a place of celebrating the kindness and the goodness of the Lord. That's what he's like. Every story reveals him and potentially our life, our journey. I want you to look at some passages with me out of, uh, we've got to do this quickly, so uh, out of Psalms 119, and then I'm going to take you to Psalm 78, and I'll see if we can do this quickly. Psalms 119, 
Don't worry, we're not going to read the whole thing. It is the longest in the Bible. I have a little sauna, and I like getting into my sauna, and I have uh, I put on my phone a Bible app that reads the Bible to me, and, and it's a, it takes about a whole sauna session to get through Psalms 119, so I learned to just push play and sit there. It's got a speaker system in there. And, oh, sweat for Jesus. All right. <laughs> Psalms 119. My grandmother used to quote this scripture to me. Uh, verse, uh, verse 11, Psalms 119, your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Uh, verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure and clean by taking heed according to the word? She used to quote those scriptures to me. Now I understand why. Verse uh, 14, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. Think about this. How is it that a testimony can compare to a million dollar check? A testimony has the potential of marking your eternal destiny because it introduces us to God and to the nature that can and must be explored. Our faith will only explore where we have understanding of his goodness. And the testimony reveals his goodness. Verse 31, I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Do not put me to shame. I will run the course of your commandments for you shall enlarge my heart. I don't know if you've ever prayed this prayer. It's in the scripture a few times. Enlarge my heart. One of the places, enlarge my heart that I might fear your name. The heart is, is the place that faith comes from. The heart is the place where relationship with God is developed. I want a big heart because I want to experience more of a big God. I want large faith to flow in and through me. So I need the enlarging in my heart. And he's declaring here that testimonies have an effect on the size of our hearts. Okay, let me put it this way. You're making me work real hard today. That's okay. All three services have been the same so far. So um, I never fault a person for the size of their brain, but the size of their heart is their responsibility. <laughs> okay, I meant well. I meant well. I really did. Verse 36, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Now, the Bible often makes comparisons between uh, this, this concept, this idea, and this concept. Whenever there's a comparison, it's because they're interrelated, even though they oftentimes, especially in Proverbs, don't seem to be connected at all. Here he says, incline my ear, make me receptive to the good news of your testimonies and not to covetousness. What is he saying? Testimonies help to refine values to where we're inspired to healthy desires and wrong desires are killed. Testimonies help to reveal to us the nature of God that gives us permission to dream, but it also shows what dreams are illegal. This testimony. Verse 46, I will speak your testimony also before kings and will not be ashamed. I will speak your testimonies before kings and not be ashamed. I don't know how this works, but somehow being mindful of the supernatural activities of God raises your place of influence where you speak to people that are outside your normal circle of friends. Why? Because God can trust you with influence because you're speaking of his nature. You're speaking of his history with humanity. Verse um, 79, let those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. Those who fear you turn to me, those who know your testimonies. Somehow testimonies increase favor with man. Yep. Yep, it is true. I'll give you one more and then we'll go to Psalm 78. 
Verse 99, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. Think, just think with me here. I have more understanding than my teachers. David's making this proclamation. I've got more understanding. I, he's not being arrogant. He's saying, look at the effect the testimony has had on my mind. My capacity to perceive reality, my capacity to be, be able to use insight in constructive, positive ways has been dramatically increased because, and he traces it back to the testimony. Whatever is true is true because it's found in the nature of God. All right, Psalm 78, we'll do this quickly, I promise. You guys all right? Yeah. Verse five says, uh, it's established a testimony in Jacob. They are to make them known to their children. The generation to come might know them. The children who would be born, that they would arise and declare them to their children. So what do we have? We have a picture of three generations. Tell the testimony to this generation, to tell it to this generation, to tell it to this generation. All right, that they may set their hope in God. What does that say? A generation without hope is a generation without testimonies. It's not a light matter. It's not like, oh, let's tell another story as, you know, story time around the fireplace and we just forget about it later. These are weighty revelations of the nature of God that carry with it a compelling invitation. We must know God in this way. Yeah. And he says multiple generations are actually affected in their eternal destiny by the measure of testimony, the influence of testimony in their thinking in their lives. Verse nine says, the children of Ephraim being armed, carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant with God. They refused to walk in his law. They forgot his works and the wonders which he had uh, shown them. When they forgot the works, the testimonies, when they forgot the testimonies, they became cowardly and were not able to face the war they were born for. You remember David, it says, on a at a time when kings went out to war, he was on his rooftop, not in war, and fell into a horrible sin. When we don't face the war we were born for, we face situations we have no grace for. And now we have the children of Ephraim. They're trained for battle. They're assigned for battle. They're gifted in battle. And again, Old Testament concept of war was concerning spiritual war in the New Testament. So we're not warring against people. It's about spiritual powers of darkness. So here's this picture. It says they are, they are equipped for triumph, trained for victory, but they turn back. And the reason they turn back is they forgot. They did not hold seriously as the great treasure of their heart, the testimony of God. One more is uh, verse 40. It says, how often they provoked him in the wilderness, they grieved him in the desert. Yet again and again, they tempted God, limited the Holy One of Israel. They didn't remember his power, the day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zone. What is, what is he saying? When they forgot the testimony, they no longer had boundaries for their relationship with God, and they actually moved into a place where they wanted to compel God to do evil on their behalf. They lost their bearings. They lost their sense of clarity. They lost their sense of, of absolutes. This is how we approach God. This is what he values. And when they lost sight of the boundary set by testimony, they wandered carelessly and they actually provoked God when they were designed to have a relationship where they would co-labor and see his work expressed in the earth to reveal his nature to all humanity. But they forfeited their opportunity because they forgot. I'm pretty much done. <laughs> yep. I, uh, 
I, I may just talk about this all summer long. I don't know. I'm, but right, right now, I don't feel like changing the subject. As I'm, I'm basically talking to me. Because I, I, honestly, I feel like there's 2.0, testimony 2.0 coming. That the Lord is going to give us this prophetic clarity. Think about this. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. There is such a prophetic mantle released through the simple stories of God's redemptive work. I want to keep going to restaurants and having people come up to me with hearing aids in their hands <laughs> or crutches or wheelchairs or something, you know. Yeah. I remember one of the folks that visited us some time ago, they, they, uh, they said goodbye to all their relatives. They were from another country. They got in a wheelchair. Doctors didn't think they could make the trip, but they, they made it. Checked into one of the hotels. And um, as they're leaving the lobby that morning, the clerk behind the counter said, oh, where are you guys off to today? They said, well, we're going to church. And they said, well, where, where are you going? They said, Bethel. He said, oh, the place where people go to get healed. And they were curious. They said, they, they knew that because they were going to the healing rooms or Sunday service or something. And they said, uh, what do you mean? Because they, they wanted to get the story. And, and the gal said, well, last week, <laughs> last week, somebody left here in a wheelchair. They came home pushing the wheelchair. So that, those are the stories you want to hear. These miracles testify of his grace. They do not testify of our significance. This is the normal Christian life. It is not for Either, either it's not for any special person or we're all special and we qualify. However you want to work that in, I don't care. But it, it is not the testimony of our significance. It is, it is the hour of the revelation of the nature of God and it happens through stories. And uh, Psalms 119 verse 111 that I didn't read said, uh, his testimonies are our inheritance forever. So the full record of anything God has ever done in, in the lives of people is your personal possession. It's not just what I've experienced. It's not just what you've experienced. But the whole gamut of God's interactions with people, we inherit the stories. It's important. It equips our thinking. It, 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 it sets our mind in a way to receive the impressions of the Lord of the miracle he now wants to perform. The things that are happening around the world with our teams, we send them to places that we, you know, we don't tell them we send them to a hard place. We, we don't let them know. We, we, you know, we get told all the time, oh, this place is the graveyard of missionaries. Nobody makes it here. Oh, we don't tell our teams that. As far as they know, it's heaven on earth there. It's, and so we don't let them know it's hard till they get back. And then it's too late. They already know. Honestly, we've just, we've just seen, you know, people come out of strokes, resurrections, all kinds of stuff. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's not just the obvious physical healings. It's the restoration of broken hearts. It's the healing of marriages. It's, it's the fractured minds that get healed. God just restores people's thinking. It's what salvation means. There's a good chance there could be somebody here this morning, you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And it would be horrible for you to be sit here all morning long with this crowd of crazy people and not come to know personally what it's like to be forgiven of sin, what it's like to be adopted, brought into God's family, what it's like for the Holy Spirit, the wonderful comforter of heaven to come and to dwell in you. If there's anybody in this room that would just say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building till I know I have peace with God, that I know what it is to receive Christ as a master, as a Lord, as a savior. If that's you, I just want you to put a hand up. By doing that, you're just saying, Bill, I don't want to leave till I know, till I know this that you've spoken of. 
Put your hands up high because I'm going to take just a moment. Make sure everybody has opportunity to surrender to this wonderful Jesus. All right. I'm going to assume you're all in, um, but we've got a banner up here. We have a team down here ready to pray for anyone who wants prayer. I'm going to ask you to stand, then I'll pray for you. You still alive? Yeah, good. That's all. It's, it's better when you're alive. <clears throat> we attract what we value. We attract what we value. For example, if you value gossip, you will attract gossip at work. I heard, I saw a wonderful meme the other day. It said, it said if you're fasting and still gossiping, go ahead and eat. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah, don't bother skipping meals. It's, it's not working, yeah. But if you value testimony, you'll attract them. There are certain people that like off-color jokes, they attract them. In any workplace, you'll see, they attract what they value. So I'm praying right now that a standard gets set in every one of our hearts to hear the stories of God's redemptive work, that we would become filled and impregnated with the revelation of God's nature through stories. We welcome that. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come even now and establish deep in our hearts testimony 2.0 for us as a church family. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Hold your places if you would. Tom will come and wrap it up.